So uh, this is, I'm Dave Nichols, I'm Jill's husband, so I get to interrupt her once in a while. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to, uh, before we begin the presentation tonight, to do two things. One is to mute yourself so we don't have background in uh, noise coming in uh, that makes it difficult for everyone else to hear the speaker. And the second thing I'd like you to do is a little different and that is to stop your video. Uh, Kevin has some great videos that he wants to show us. And if we have everyone feeding their videos into all the pictures that you see on the screen, then it, I think it's gonna make it more difficult for him to present his uh, videos to you. So to mute, you can go to the lower left corner of your Zoom meeting screen and click on the mute uh, icon and right next to it is a stop video icon and you can stop your video and thank you so much everyone for already getting doing that uh, many of you have already done it so so I appreciate that quite a bit so please uh, stop your video and please mute and now I'll give it back to Jill to do the introduction okay thanks Dave uh, so we will say that after Kevin speaks, you'll all be invited to turn your videos back on and unmute yourself so that you can ask questions and so that we can visit a little bit more. So don't go away when it's all over. But tonight, I'd like to tell you that our speaker tonight is Kevin Flynn. And Kevin has climbed the seven summits. Uh, those are the seven highest peaks on each continent. He, um, and even though he had done the highest peaks on all seven continents, he still calls himself an amateur peak bagger. I don't, I don't know how that qualifies as amateur at this point, but he started climbing mountains in 1975 when he graduated from high school. He and some buddies went to the Adirondacks for a six day backpacking trip. They didn't know what they were doing. They started right out with Haystack as their very first mountain. And that is still one of Kevin's favorite mountains. He's gained, as he, as he continued to hike mountains, he gained experience, he gained gear, and the more gear and experience he got, the higher the mountains got, the bigger the mountains got. Anyway, he finds great joy from climbing and being in the mountains. And I'd like you to welcome him and he'll tell you all about that. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Thanks. Jill, and thanks, Dave. And uh, also Katie Kuzak, who wrote me into this. And Katie and I used to work together a long, long time ago. And Dave is going to help me share my screen. So let me just drag this. It might take me a second. And I haven't done too many of these things via Zoom. I've done a lot of them. Let's see. Dave, are we seeing this? Uh, we can see, you need to choose which screen you're going to show. Okay. Desktop, I think. There? There you go. Okay. Very good. And then you can put it into slide. Slide. Mode. Yeah. Sorry about the little, you know, and this may happen from time to time, folks, uh, as we go along. Uh, especially if the videos run and it gets a little sketchy. Jill and Dave have promised to give my cell a call if they need to slow me up or stop me or any of that kind of thing goes. But it's true, I love mountains. And it's also true that we, back in 1975, when we did our first trip in the Adirondacks, we sure didn't know what we were doing. We approached uh, Haystack and we're like, oh, that's there right in front of us. And then right behind it, that must be Marcy, except it was Little Haystack and then regular Haystack behind it. So we really didn't know what we were doing. Probably used our food bag to sleep on as a pillow at night, unaware of any bear danger. Uh, but it really, uh, once I got above Timberline, it really set the hook for me for the mountains. And I, I, I know many of you spent a lot of time in the Adirondacks and I absolutely love the Adirondacks. They're my touchstone. I keep going back there um, very often. Katie Kuzak will tell you, she sort of got interested in it and, and she picked my brain for a lot of good mountains to climb and routes and, and advice on that. And I'm happy to share the mountains with most anyone. And I feel just 
so fortunate as an amateur mountaineer that that I kind of followed my my passion and, and the mountains did seem to get bigger along the way and I never really in, intended to do the seven summits but it just kind of happened that way once I was in the Adirondacks I'm a two-time 46er uh, then uh, then I could, the first time some friend said hey we should climb Mount Washington in the winter in New Hampshire and that was the first time I had an ice axe and uh, crampons on and boy that felt really cool and we had a great time and that kind of led to a few trips on Denali. And I will tell you that, you know, I haven't always made it to the top each time I went. It took me two tries up Denali, two times up uh, Aconcagua, and Everest, I was on two expeditions, 2002 where I got to high camp, and then 2004 when I was lucky enough to, uh, to just barely make the summit. So this photo you're looking at here is taken on the top of the bottom of the world, that's Mount Vincent in uh, Antarctica. It's a little over 16,000 feet. And you can see, let's see, you can see some of the frost on my hair. It was very, very cold, but it was a bluebird day and pretty light wind. So I kind of call my presentation dream big and dare to fail. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about passion uh, in it as well. And Oftentimes I talk to groups like you who are really already into the mountains and, and the outdoors. So you, you get it. Uh, so, but other times I talk to folks who would never, you know, uh, roughing it would be holiday in, that would be the worst they would go. So, so I share with them a few things. And one of the things I talk about is I love this cheesy bit of uh, uh, a photo here of a, of a physician. And it's, I invented this term PDD and that stands for passion deficit disorder. And I think a lot of people go through life, you know, not having uh, something they're really happy about and really like to pursue. And I've been really lucky because, you know, I'm a, I'm a business owner, so I'm passionate about our business. And it's been very fortunate for me because I've had partners and they've allowed me to have the flexibility to go to all seven continents on the planet. So that's been really great. I'm also, passionate about education. So I had, I started out very poorly, which is sort of a theme of mine, you know, slow starter, uh, but ended up, uh, you know, really enjoying the educational experience in college and grad school. And I also learned to fly little planes for business. So I, I now own a small plane. And I was telling Jill and Dave, one of my favorite things to do is to play hooky one day, leave really early out of the Rochester airport, fly up to Lake Placid, uh, land there and usually I can arrange for a beater rental car and I've done the cold and trap dike a couple of times uh, giant whatnot a few things like that and I'll get done like 3 30 4 o'clock 5 o'clock jump back in my plane and I'll be home for dinner for beer and wings and stuff like that so that's pretty cool um, so this is a quote that I really like by a gentleman named Howard Thurman which is don't ask what the world needs ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is people who've come alive. So I think those of us like us who really enjoy the outdoors and the mountains really already understand that quite well. Let's see. I also came up with this formula. It's pretty simple. It's called P plus P plus P equals P, which stands for, you take your passion and then the persistence and then you know if you're going to climb a mountain, a big mountain, or even in the Adirondacks, wherever, you're going to have some pain along the way. But boy, when you get to the top, that, that's pretty pleasurable. So, so I think it really requires your passion and a lot of persistence, you know, getting in shape and uh, having the right gear and understanding what to do. And then putting up with some pain, you know, who knows, it might rain sideways at 38 degrees and blowing at 50 miles an hour. But somehow getting to the top seems to always make it worthwhile. At least it does for me. So this is a clip. I'm just going to kind of take you. I can stop this. I'm going to take you around the world. So this is a quick review of the seven summits. But it, there really is an eighth summit, which is uh, it could either be uh, Kosciuszko in Australia. But some people think Karsten's Pyramid in uh, Papua New Guinea is the seventh summit. So I ended up doing both of them. But this first one, my first big peak was uh, Mount McKinley. And like I said, it took me two tries. Yeah, the summit of Mount McKinley. It's 
job. Oh, that was back in 93. The sun is not yet up. Above us, the moon is a crescent shape. We take in the view. It's exquisite. All of East Africa in its pre dawn glory. Oops, sorry about that. Highest mountain in the Western Hemisphere. So that was Aconcagua. Panoramic from the summit of Mount Elbrus, highest mountain in Europe. Right now, the uh, its twin peak is coming into uh, view there. It's about 20 meters lower than Elbrus proper. So I just stop it for a second. So that's <clears throat> Antarctica. And shockingly, there are no direct flights from Rochester to Antarctica. So this is an old uh, Russian military cargo jetliner that still is running today. It, it lands on the ice and then you take smaller otters <clears throat> to get to uh, Vincent uh, base camp. But that's a pretty crazy, uh, crazy plane ride there. So that's me and my wife on uh, Kosciuszko in Australia. So that was technically my seventh summit. And you'll see me make it in a seven summit sign. And there might be a bottle of champagne on top of there somewhere, possibly. So that's me on a uh, Tyrolean traverse. That's pretty funky. That that Karsten's Pyramid is really an amazing place, but it's pretty far away and off the beaten track. Show me seven fingers. Well, we'll make it eight. Uh, yeah. So this next clip, so I'm gonna, <clears throat> this was taken uh, at 2002, right now it's just a blank screen right now, uh, but this was in 2002, my, my first trip to Mount Everest, so much self-doubt, am I good enough to make it? And you know, my, my first trip was 10 weeks door to door. You put all this training into it, it it's certainly not cheap to do. Uh, you, you do uh, a number of acclimatization forays up and down the mountain. And back in 2002, I, I told myself, you know, if I was just got to high camp, which is 26,200 feet, and I was a good teammate and I didn't kill myself or anyone else, I thought that would be pretty good. But when I did get to high camp and we were ready, we were supposed to go for the summit that night, I, I was just really late and... Uh, so I shot some video of myself, and if you can listen carefully to my voice, you can uh, hear what a defeated soul I am here. Oh, there it is. This is from High Camp, tantalizingly close. Where Camp 4? I came in pretty late. I just didn't feel like I had enough to turn around in four or five hours for the summit. So I'm gonna wait here another night, see if I have it in me to go. If not, I'll have to turn my back on the summit. Which I don't want to do, but first. So um, not going to lie to you, I, I was hoping we'd go the next day and it didn't happen. And even though I said all those things, it'd be a successful trip if I just made it up there. Um, shortly thereafter, I was crying like Nancy Kerrigan in the tent. And uh, 
All I knew was I wanted to get off that mountain, go home, heal. And I was cured of big mountains forever. I was never, ever going back. And, you know, e even though I, I gave it a decent try, I, it really felt like a failure. And it's never wrong to turn your back on the mountain if, if you're not ready. So, I mean, from that part, it's, it's smart decision making. But it's an awful, you know, long way down. It's another two days to get back to base camp, another three or four days to trek out to Lukla and then fly to Kathmandu and then fly through multiple places to get back to the States. And when I finally got into LA and I was clearing customs, I, uh, I ran into a situation where I, I had to clear the customs, but I had these huge, uh, big uh, sacks, you know, cargo bags of, of stuff. And this overweight uh, customs border dude was talking with me and he sees that I'm in Nepal for like 70 days or 65 days. And he asked me, you know, what were you doing? Now, of course, if I made the summit, I was like, oh, climb Mount Everest. Yeah. So I was like, well, I was in a mountain expedition. Yeah, which one? Uh, Everest. And then he goes, oh, really? So of course they ask, you know, they always ask you a measure of success. So did you get to the top? So I was trying to make myself, you know, seem a little bit better. And I said, well, you know, I, I got to high camp. It was 26,200 feet after, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks. And he goes, well, how much longer would it have taken you to get to the top and, and back? And I said, well, probably about, you know, 14 hours. And he looks at me, you know, this overweight guy who probably takes the escalator because the stairs are too challenging. And he goes, yeah, you should have gone for the top, you know, but I kind of fixed it because I wrote a book later and that has multiple chapters in it. And I have a little chapter on that incident and it's titled Cheese Dick at LAX. So I, I, I got him a little bit, I think so. But the weird thing is, you know, two weeks after oh, going there, oops, sorry. two weeks after I got home or so in 2002, you know, well, immediately my wife was Maggie. She's like, hey, I support you. If you want to go back, whatever you need to do. At the time, I had two business partners, my uh, brother and a fellow named Ray. And, and, you know, and though I had been gone 10 weeks, they're like, hey, man, if you need to go back, we fully support you. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm done with big mountains forever. It's all good. So, you know, don't worry about it. But it's funny, the cure didn't take. And then I got pretty obsessed and I was like, damn it, if only I had done this, that, and a few little things better, I know I could make it. And, and during the, the first trip, I was just worried about everything. There was a Maoist uprising that was happening in Nepal at the time. And that had me freaked and, you know, I worried about, am I good enough? Can I really do this? I mean, I worried about a lot. And the thing about worry is there's two different things. One is probably 90% of the stuff you worry about either never happens or you have no control over it. And, you know, so why worry twice? So this, this time I went back in 2004, I, I found myself flying back. This is the airport in Lukla, which is the beginning of the trek into Everest Base Camp. And it's this really funky little airstrip. And as a pilot, it's, it's pretty exciting. There's a little cliff below here. And at the end of the runway, there's the side of a mountain. So there's no going around. You either make it or you don't. So about 22 months later, after being utterly defeated, I found myself back in Nepal and heading up uh, Mount Everest. So that was really exciting. And this time, I enjoyed it so much more. I was just gonna take all the sights in. And even just the trek in is about 10 days to uh, get to base camp. Cause you start in Lukla at about 9,000 feet and base camp is about 17.5. So you gotta take your time to acclimatize. But I really enjoyed all, all parts of it. We climbed two or three little trekking peaks on the way up uh, just to, to acclimatize better. Pass through little villages that are cool. Like this is kind of the this is Namche Bazaar, which is the heart of, uh, of the uh, Sherpa lands through the Kumbu uh, Valley. Uh, this is at about, I think around 10,500 feet or so. Really beautiful place. And along the way, this is Jason uh, Tangway, one of the climbers I was with, and he was flying a kite just out of Pe Pengbo Che. And this brought a lot of the little villager kids out to uh, watch them fly the kite and he let them take turns flying the kite. So again, just really enjoying it. And this is 
Ama de Blom in the background, which is a really beautiful mountain. And this is one of the first views that you never really from base camp, you don't see the true summit of Everest, but basically anyone who goes to Everest base camp climbs this trekking peak called Kala Patar, which is about, I don't know, 18,500 feet or something like that. And from there you get a, just a wonderful view of Everest. And this is basically the Southeast Ridge, the South Summit, and then the, the Knife's Edge Ridge here, Hillary Step somewhere around there and then the, the final summit. But it looks pretty funky from that angle. And it's one of those, oh my gosh, we're gonna do that. But yep. So I found myself back at base camp. And one of the things you do at base camp, this is a puja, an altar, uh, a chorten, or a, yeah, I think so. And, uh, but you have a puja, a puja is a ceremony. The Sherpa people are amazing and wonderful, but they're, they're all Buddhists. And, and quite religious. And so before any expedition can start, a puja ceremony happens. A, a, a Buddhist monk hikes up from you know, lower village and you have to kind of basically bless the trips. You put your crampon in there, up there and ice axes and things like that. So you wanna have an auspicious and good puja. So you'll hear some of the singing and chanting. There's the kumbu ice ball in the background. So we're having this great puja and then there's this big uh, avalanche that happens and but we considered it auspicious since the avalanche didn't hit us so you know it's all good. And after the puja gets on that's when we start the climbing and as probably most of you know you can't just go all the way up to the top without acclimatizing your body and getting used to the uh, lack of oxygen at higher elevations. So this is the route. So from base camp, we'd go through the Kumbu Icefall, base camp being about 17.5 and camp one being just about 20,000 feet. Camp there for a couple days and then go up through the Western Coom and go to advanced base camp at about 21,300 feet camp for another, you know, sleep for another couple of nights, and then come all the way back to base camp, spend five, six days recovering, then make another foray, go up to camp one, whoops, sorry. Sorry, that cursor moved on me, but then go back up again. So spend a night at camp one, spend maybe three or four days at camp two, and then we would go to camp three without supplemental oxygen, sleep there without supplemental oxygen for a night. Then the next morning, wake up, uh, climb up a little bit higher uh, to try and get more acclimatized using the, uh, the oxygen, supplemental oxygen to make sure we got it all dialed in. Sleep another night up at camp three, come back down to camp two and then all the way back down to base camp where we would then rest and recover. And then, and then finally we would be ready to go for the summit. So. I've got a little bit of footage here, about a minute or so of uh, this gentleman who's going over actually happens to now be the mayor of Portland, Oregon, a fellow named Ted Wheeler. And he's been going through lots of stuff in that, that city has been sort of besieged with lots of protests. So he's been in the news a lot, but he's a wonderful guy. This was from the 2002 expedition, so. Across a little crevasse, look down in and jump.
so you can hear the heavy breathing, uh, and that's just through the Kumbu Icefall, and that's just slightly under 19,000 feet. But the Kumbu Icefall is both, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a fun climb, but it's also really scary because it's basically, an icefall is a frozen waterfall that is moving like two or three feet a day. And there's often these giant ice towers and blocks as big as a garage or a railroad car that could tumble at any time. And, and it's a pretty dangerous place. So, whoops, it's texting me. And uh, so this next shot here is from Camp One and you're looking up at the Western Coombe right in here. And this is the Lotse face. This here is the yellow band. Camp three is right around here. Camp two is right around here. And then you climb up over the Geneva Spur. That's high camp at camp four. That's the ridge you climb. That's the south summit and then the true summit. And people always ask, well, how cold is it? Well, it's both, sometimes it's, it's always extreme. It's either too cold or sometimes too hot. In this area here, it got really, really hot. And I'll also tell you one time as I was coming through the Kumbu Weissfall, on my way down, we were a little bit late and so the sun was out. And with all that heavy breathing we did, would do, our tongues were exposed. So you could see, so the tip of my tongue got actually sunburned. Uh, that's how hot it was. So it's a, it's, it's a world in a land of extremes. This next one I think is of some storm footage from 2002, lest you just see all nice weather. Oh, uh, this is Kevin. Uh, we're getting whaled on by the wind really well. <coughs> Tuck is uh, out trying to build a rock wall in front of his tent or else he's going to lose it. We've had some damage mm -hmm. to the main mess tent. You. And uh, so far all the other tents are holding. But uh, it is, it's really, really blown over. <coughs> we're uh, at ABC on uh, <coughs> I think Friday. April 26th, the wind is howling, we've lost a couple tents, well, our mess tent's kind of in tatters, we haven't lost any tents, but we are working it, it is really, really rocking. Oh, this is Kevin, we are working it, it is really, really rocking. Okay, so that storm lasted about 30 hours and maybe, I don't know, 80 mile an hour winds, uh, if not more. And again, that was a camp too, if I didn't say. And uh, that was quite the experience. And, and I slept pretty much, or didn't sleep all night because I had my back up against the wind against my tent poles, hoping that the poles wouldn't break because that would have been pretty unpleasant. But we made it through the night and it worked out. So this next shot is a shot from advanced base camp, about 21,500 feet, uh, zoomed in to the uh, camp three and then pulling out. And then I'll tell a little story as we go along. So that's camp three other the tents up there. Very icy perch. So in, in 2002, on my trip there, we went, you know, we were doing our, our final acclimatization foray. We were going to spend a couple nights up at Camp 3. So we climbed up the Lhotse face, which is very steep and very, very icy, you know, and you, you're clipped in with, uh, on fixed lines with an ascender and then also a backup safety carabiner as you pass over the anchors of ice crews and snow pickets on your way up. And we got up there in about, I don't know, four or five hours and camp three is a desperate little perch. And when, as soon as we got there, the winds kind of came up. So we spent the night there without oxygen and it was just howling. The next morning we wanted to do, come down and it was visibility was really, really limited. It was snowing, it was bad, but so we hemmed and hawed about what decision to make. So we finally decided that we would, uh, we would give it a try. And there were just three of us up there. Uh, that guy, Ted Wheeler, another guy, uh, an attorney from uh, Waco, Texas. And we got out of our tents at about 2 p.m. Ted and I started down and almost immediately 
thereafter, we committed to going down. Stuart stayed in the tent because his hands and feet got really cold. And so we were fighting our way down and we had really good walkie talkies and we're talking to base camp and they said, well, you know, you and Ted, Kevin, you guys, you go down, get, we wanted to get back down to camp too. And Stuart, you stay up there. But any event, it was really, really desperate. We were making decent progress. We probably descended about a thousand vertical feet or so. And then one of the fixed lines had just buried itself in an avalanche underneath the ice. And we, it was really blowing. So we knew right away our best decision was to go back up. So we had to regain uh, camp three and it was getting close to dark and everyone at base camp is listening to us. You know, it's like, hey, they're gonna get back there. They're gonna be okay. So we were that day's entertainment for a lot of folks. And we did get back up there. We, we you know, sucked on some supplemental oxygen and that was good. And so the next morning we got up and there was only one other group. There was a, a, a British dude and someone from the Czech Republic. And it was still windy, but it was clear. And so we all decided to go down. They left first, they weren't really part of our group. So they left about 10 minutes before us. They said, hey, we'll see you down there. And as we were just out of the tents and making our way down, we got a message on the walkie talkie that there had been a fall on the load safe face no reason to believe that it's survivable. So one of those two guys, a British uh, man named Peter Liggett, must have missed a, 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 a knot or something and, uh, and missed the, the fixed lines and, and fell to his death. I mean, once you start sliding, you bounce. And, and, and we were told, you know, seal, steal yourself because you're gonna see evidence of, of the fall uh, on the way down. And there was kind of a blood and tissue trail. And, and he ended up, in this Berg's run down there. And uh, so that was very, very sobering. You know, at any time, you know, something can go wrong. So you always have to be really on guard and really careful. So this is a, a shot of what the tents look like at Camp 3 at about 24,000 feet. Again, you wanna be clipped into the, to the fixed lines here if you're going to gather snow or you're gonna take a leak or do whatever. So that is just a, not a place you're, you're gonna be able to fall. So at this point, I think there's a video coming up of my really good friend, Brian Sheedy, who we were what was called non-guided clients on this, but there were five of us going for the summit. But even though we were non-guided clients, we had tremendous Sherpa support, really, really great logistics and all that kind of stuff. So this is, if I'm not well, mistaken- Well, you probably can't hear me very well. This is my friend, Brian. This is from the tent in uh, Camp 3 at uh, 24,000 feet. And Brian is gonna explain what our plan is. This We are now on our summit run in 2004. So this is our plan, we're at 24,000 feet. Now, so I'll take this off for just a little bit. But uh, we're breathing some sweet O's here. And uh, we're on our, hopefully our summit foray and uh, we're at 24,000 foot and we've got uh, both of us are connected to the same bottle both Kevin and I and uh, we're both breathing three quarters of a liter of oxygen um, uh, three quarters of a liter per minute hold on a second That feels pretty good. So this was basically <clears throat> the Thursday, night of Thursday, May 13th. And this is really, right after this night is when the, the climb really starts. So the idea is get out of the tent as early as possible and get up to high camp at 26,200 feet by 1 p.m. the next day. So that's Friday, uh, May 14th, I think. And last time I was late getting out of the tent, my goggles fogged up, I was slow. I didn't pull into high camp until like four, 4.30. So our, our goal is to get to high camp by 1 p.m., uh, hydrate, rest, eat as much food as we can at 26,200 feet, even though you don't feel like eating. Try and sleep maybe three hours, and then at 9, 9.30, that same night, you've just climbed up, you know, uh, 2,300 feet that same night, 
get ready to go for the summit and be off for the summit at 1030 at night. And then hopefully that Saturday morning by you know eight or 9 a.m., get to the summit, tag it and get back down uh, you know, with lots of light to spare. At least that that's the plan. So, and that worked out well. You probably and that worked out really well. This is us climbing out of Camp Three. This is the yellow band, uh, which is pretty cool. That was at one point uh, on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you know, the Himalayas were caused by the tectonic plates crashing and then moving upward. So supposedly there are sea fossils in there, but I didn't stop to look for any. But Made good time up to camp four and I, the weather was good. So that was great. So this, I'll just stop it real quickly. This is me shooting that same video that I started with when I was so um, bummed out on my failed trip in 2002. So this is me basically shooting that same video and then a little flashback to 2002 and then back again to 2004. And if you can listen to my voice, and the difference in it, I, I think you can hear uh, that I, I'm doing better. This is a look outside of our tent from high camp. It's a little breezy. It was a little breezier when we got here, so maybe that's boating well and that the winds will diminish. And uh, looking forward to getting this underway. Pretty awesome after all this time to be right on the doorstep. And for me, wow, what a difference. <laughs> From high camp, realizing we close. Or camp four. I came in pretty late. I just didn't feel like I had enough to turn around in four or five hours and go for the summit. <laughs> I came up here last time and got a late start, did my oxygen poorly. Maybe I wasn't in as good a shape as I should have been. Oh, my goggles fogged up. I didn't pull into camp until probably close to four, which is about what it is now. We pulled in about one o'clock. I was totally knackered before. And now, you know, it was tiring, but, uh, but I feel like uh, we have it in me for, uh, for a good summit attempt. So God willing, hopefully it'll work out. Well, here we are. So this is, this is uh, on our summit day, the way it was going to work out. I climbed with, uh, this is Dan Barter, a guy named Jason and Brian, who you all saw a little bit of so far. And then there was another guy, Ron, who we weren't as close with. And then it was going to be the five of us Westerners and four Sherpas uh, going for the summit. And this guy, Dan Barter was super strong, really nice guy. And I was with him in Antarctica and, and Papua New Guinea, just love the guy. But you can hear, this is at 26,200 feet, but just listen to the optimism in his voice and the strength and what a good guy he is, so. Hi, Camp. A few hours away from going for the summit bid. So I'm just, Organizing, putting on the layers, and just uh, getting ready to go. Describe today for me, if you would. Today we uh, started out early, 6.30, 7 a.m. Looking slow and easy. Up a little space, across the yellow band, which is kind of interesting, uh, mixed rock and ice. Uh, and we cut across to the uh, Geneva Spur and mostly rock there. The last section was a uh, really steep, probably about 60 degree incline, maybe 70 degrees at times. And with a lot of rock, we get up to the top of the spur and it was just a rocky traverse across to the uh, South Col. And uh, good test, uh, we all did good, uh, took it easy and uh, didn't waste ourselves and hopefully got that energy for the uh, Summit uh, starting today, tonight. And, uh, uh, hydrated, had some food, and uh, everything's uh, in place. And uh, Sherpas, uh, got our own personal Sherpas, and be off and running. So, 
is what it's all about. Feeling good, spirits are good, body willing, weather willing. We're gonna be there tomorrow. Right on. So, so yeah, you might not have heard it because the wind was blowing a little bit, but I think he said 53 days to get to this point. So it, it does take a long time. And then it's really funny because you spend all this time and it's like, oh my gosh, but then time becomes really compressed when you go for the summit and it becomes a very, very valuable commodity does time. So this is a video now of me at that night when we got up and you know, you never know what the weather is going to bring. So here's what I said. Oh, here we are. All right. Uh, it is uh, the night. It's about 25 after 9, uh, May 14th. Uh, we've just been rousted by our Sherpas, given some hot drinks. And uh, this is to be our summit night, although it's pretty windy out. So <laughs> we're not sure if we're just going to. Right now, the plan is to hydrate, eat some food be ready to go and at 10 30 we're going to make a decision as to whether or not <coughs> we'll go for the summit oh uh, we're pretty fat on oxygen so another plan might be to just wait out here and hope that the weather improves and go to tomorrow night and hopefully the weather will be better but we'll see uh that's what happens on big mountains and we we're hoping the wind will be gone by now but we'll see so what we did was finally we hemmed and hawed, what are we going to do? And we decided that, you know, oftentimes the wind can be up a little bit, but, but it will calm down through the night and the next day and the forecasts were looking good. So we made the decision to go for it, go for it. And we were going to be the first group to head for the summit. There was a couple of other expeditions along with some of their Sherpas. So the route wasn't totally put in, in terms of fixed lines all the way to the summit. So some of the stronger Sherpers were gonna go ahead of the group and fix the last little bit, basically from the South Summit to the, the true summit. Uh, but again, it's pretty crazy. So we left, not at 10.30 at night, but at about 10 after 11. So we lost about 40 minutes there. And it was a spectacular, beautiful night. I could see a lightning storm way, way far off in the distance. Um, and you know, you're, all, you're sort of, within your own world is your headlamp. So I had a, a Sherpa with me who was carrying two big cylinders of oxygen. I only had one and we were gonna get to the halfway point, store my half used cylinder of oxygen there. Then he was gonna give me the full cylinder to go to the summit and then back there and then use the rest of the other oxygen. And the Sherpas who are all stronger than us Westerners would breathe oxygen at about half the rate as, as us. So we all took off there. So five Westerners and four Sherpas. Everything was going pretty well, except that one of the Sherpas had some lower GI issues. And so he turned around and I kind of forgot this or didn't know it, but he gave his extra 17 pound uh, oxygen canister to my Sherpa, Mingma Shearing. So Mingma is now carrying three of those 17 pound uh, uh, canisters of oxygen. Uh, up to he's going to go to the balcony about the halfway part with it. So that all was, in, you know, so that wasn't good necessarily. So we get to this place just about at sunrise, which is just a little bit lower than this, where my cursor is called the uh, balcony. And at that point, another Sherpa, his oxygen bottle malfunctioned. So he went down. So now we were left with just uh, two Sherpas and the, uh, and the five of us climbers, but we had all the, uh, we had enough oxygen to go for it. And the weather was perfect. I, this photo was taken by someone from, uh, a Lotse some years ago. And I just really like it because it shows the route. And basically the balcony is, I think just around here or maybe right here. And then you can see the trail up here. That's the Southeast Ridge Trail, that's the South Summit. You climb down, climb there. You go over to here, there's the uh, uh, Hillary Step and then the last bit there. Whoops, sorry. Sorry, my cursor's betraying me a bit. So a little close up here, 
and you can see some of the climbers along this ridge. But the thing about this ridge is you just keep going and going. It's one foot in front of the other. And oxygen, supplemental oxygen, only brings you down another 3,000 feet. So you're still moving pretty slowly. And your mental acuity isn't always at your finest. So we're making progress. And I know we, we need to be at certain places by a certain time or else we're going to be in trouble. And so here's another shot. So somewhere around here or so, I realize we're not quite to the south summit yet. And to go from basically the south summit to the summit and back is about a two to three hour round trip. And so I check my watch. It's a nice Sunto with altimeter and all that stuff. And it's 1030 in the morning already. And I'm like, oh no, we're really, really late. This isn't gonna work out. I'm trying to do my math in my head. And I say to Jason, who I know is a really good, strong climber, I go, hey man, are we okay on time? He's like, yeah, we're, we're doing okay. Um, and there was also a little bit more of a delay because of some of the fixed lines weren't in and one of the Sherpa teams didn't show up. So they had to cut out old fixed ropes from before and refix them. So again, we lost a little bit more time. So I'm like, wow, 1030. And then Mingma Shearing, who is my Sherpa, I say, Mingma, are we okay? And he's got his very uh, shy voice. Yes, we are fine. So in another 10 or 20 minutes, I look at my watch again and it's still 1030. And I'm like, wait a minute, except that I'm an idiot because it's an altimeter watch. And what I'm looking at is the actual barometric pressure, which is about one third of what it is at sea level. Normally the barometric pressure is like 3000, 3032, 29 or 0.92. So I, I hit the little button and it's all of a sudden it's 807 AM. And I go, hey, we must just be able to climb this sucker. And that's, that's once you, you never see the true summit of Everest until you get to the South summit. And man, it's kind of intimidating because this is really steep down here and it looks like it's a long way away and, and it's pretty exposed. So this is a shot of me going up that ridge and in the yellow right behind me is Ming Mishiring. And this is Makalu. Uh, in the background, that's the fifth tallest mountain in the world. And now we're getting above it. So I'm like, pretty sweet. And this is Karma Rita, uh, also another awesome Sherpa. And so another great shot of uh, just looking down. In fact, that's on the cover of my book called Mount Everest, Confessions of an Amateur Peak Bagger. I'll put a plug in for there if you want it. It's available on Amazon. So anyways, and this is finally the view from the south summit, you have to descend down here. You see the fixed line and you see some climbers up here. And by the time I got to here, I was doing, started feeling really tired, but hell, everyone's really tired at that point. So I got really, really slow going down here, going up and I got to the, uh, the Hillary step and climbed that okay. And by the time I got to here above the Hillary step, I'd always heard, oh, now you got it. It's only like a 10 minute stroll to this summit. And I knew it was getting a little later in the day. And I did one of the stupid amateur things that uh, you know, you've probably heard folks in the Adirondacks do where they go, hey, how much farther to the top? And I couldn't help myself. I asked Mingma and he said, well, only 10 minutes more, but I was so tired, but I still just kind of like a zombie, I carried on and on. And it took more like a half an hour to get to the true summit. We didn't get up there until about 2.10. And by that time, my teammates were already heading on the way down. And they're like, hey, man, you know, it's getting really, really late. So I knew it was late, but we made the summit. And, you know, after all this time, it's so awesome. You always think about what can you do for like a great summit shot and look so cool on the summit. So that's me on the summit. You can see my lips are almost blue. No smiling. Uh, I did take a great shot of Mingma, who's only about 5'4", but he looks like he's about six foot there and he's so unbelievably strong. So the weird thing that happens, and I don't have really many photographs on the way down, is people go, what's it like to stand on the summit of Everest? And I'm like, I wouldn't know because I was so tired that I just sat down there. And the only thing I could think about was, you know, snap a few pictures and just try to get home and get down. And so I thought I'd be better on the descent. And it was just like someone had pulled the plug on me. And 
I was so slow and I got to the uh, Hillary step where it's a couple of uh, just rappel down a couple of little wraps down there. And I was just about to the bottom of it where I missed my step and I got turned upside down basically. And I was hanging upside down and it took me an attempt or two to kind of right myself and it, that didn't quite work out. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. But again, you, you know, I should have been really scared, but because you're, you know, little lacking oxygen. Finally, you know, Mi'kmaq comes to my side and he cuts some of the ropes I'm tangled in. And he helps me get, get back my bearings down there. God bless him. And <clears throat> we get about, we go along that ridge. And then I look that we got to climb back up the South Summit. And I'm like, you know, Mi'kmaq, I'm just going to bivouac here. So I, I, uh, I radioed down to base camp and I told them my plan. They're like, uh, dude, uh, not a good idea. Do you have any meds on you? Uh, so I had nifedipine, uh, dexamethasone and Dymox. So they said you should take that. And that probably was really, really smart because unbeknownst to me at that time, somewhere on my summit day, I developed pneumonia. So I got really tired, uh, but I was able to, you know, along with Mingma, and it was just Mingma and me left at this point. We were the last two guys on the summit. Thank God the weather was perfect. So I was finally able to make the South Summit and I had to rest continuously and I would just lean back into the hill and Mingma would let me take a couple of breaths and he would say to me, Kevin, please, we must go. And he should have been yelling at me because it was really, he was taking the brunt of it. So we got just past the South Summit when my oxygen ran out. And I just kind of nonchalantly mentioned it to Mingma. And he's like, hey, he, he just immediately gave me his ox oxygen. And they, down at base camp, they knew that uh, we were having some struggles. So like I said, we had brilliant logistics. So a couple of Sherpas came up and met us up at the balcony. And by that time, it was getting dark. And so they brought extra oxygen. And Mingma went down on his own because he put in God, more than enough work. And so I went down with the other two Sherpas and I left, I finally pulled into high camp at about, uh, I want to say 10.45 PM. So we had left the night before at 11.10 PM. So it was almost 24 hours to get back down to high camp. And I slept very, very poorly, you know, a lot of hacking and coughing. And then it was two more days to get down to base camp. And, you know, normally when you go, when you descend, the air gets thicker and it's like, you know, Popeye getting spinach, you get stronger and stronger. But that wasn't happening for me because, you know, unbeknownst to me at that time, I had pneumonia. And so it was, it was a major struggle to get back down to base camp, but did make it down to base camp. And this is me and Brian, you can see we're wearing lots of zinc oxide to protect ourselves from the sun. So this is after we we just gotten down to base camp. We're through the Kumbu ice fall. All the danger is gone. And so like, I've just had always thought about this would be the big celebration. And Brian and I are the same heights, but I'm just withered at this point. And our, our leader of the expedition who ran it, uh, Mark Tucker, Tucker said, hey, you should get checked out in the Everest uh, medical uh, tent and see how you're doing. Well, I never went back to my own tent. They, my O2 sat was in the low 70s. They said, you have pneumonia. I was severely dehydrated. I had a temperature of 101. And uh, they put a bunch of IVs in me. I think I had five bags through the night. And I was, you know, complaining to this, the doctor. And I said to her, I'm like, oh man, I, I didn't do this with style. You know, some Sherpas came up. And she goes, hey, wait a minute. You know, look, I don't know why you do what you do, but you should feel pretty good about yourself. You just, you know, summited Everest and you had pneumonia. You got yourself all the way back down to base camp. And uh, she sort of gave me permission to feel good about myself. So the next morning I was feeling better, but, you know, still not amazing. And they were a little bit worried about me. And they're like, hey, if we can get a chopper in here, we'd like to get you into Kathmandu. And I figure I might be having to go to a hospital or something. And I was like, okay, yeah, if a chopper can come in, that'd be cool. I've never been on a helicopter. And so this is us along with my buddy, Brian. That's me and Dan Barter. Oops, sorry. And we're waiting for the chopper to get there. And, and it's always pretty dangerous to get a chopper into those altitudes. And you can see this is where they stuck me to put the IVs in me. Uh, so here comes the chopper and it's a shot of the chopper arriving. You don't necessarily see me get loaded in, but you'll see how the chopper struggles at that altitude to get out of there.
Oh, yeah, you see that? He just barely got off the ground. That's, that's, oh, second, that's second double bag almost put him over. <laughs> I think you were right at the limit there. Yeah. Woo! So that was a really cool way. Instead of doing the three day trek out, I got the chopper took me directly to Kathmandu and there was a car waiting for me. And we went to a clinic and uh, it wasn't the hospital. And the doctor there, uh, she goes, wow, oh, you're my Everest climber. We've been waiting for you all morning. You know, she checked me out. She goes, yep, yeah, you're, you're doing better. They gave you good meds here. Continue to take these. It was like a Z pack or something and some throat lozenges and, uh, you know, drink plenty of fluids and all that stuff and don't go crazy and uh, you're free to go. And I was like, sweet. So Saturday I'm on the summit of Everest. Monday I'm back in base camp. Tuesday I'm I'm in Kathmandu where it's warm and and so it was a really cool way to sort of get back at it. I missed the trek out with my buddies, but it was an amazing adventure. And then you know what the most important part of any climb is? That's coming home safely. So this is me at the airport with my wife and I lost probably 15, 20 pounds. Some of my nieces and nephews there. So that's the most important thing is getting back. So. That was my uh, excellent two uh, Everest adventures and happy to share it with you. And I'll, I'll quit out of this now and uh, be happy to take questions. So you can feel free to unmute yourself and to start your video again, please. Welcome back. Thank you, Kevin, that was Interesting to hear that whole story. It was did, awesome. Did the videos play all right? Yeah, I mean, I can't tell. I, I, there's no feedback for me here. They played great. Beautiful, great. It, it, it worked. I think having people uh, turn off their videos really allowed all those videos to play. Great. Well, um, th well, thanks everyone. I, I you know, I, I really enjoy sharing it. Uh, that story, there's so much more to it that you know I can't really talk about an hour, but there's just, just such great camaraderie and, and folks who were so good to me uh, during all of my trips and you learn a lot. And uh, I, I felt so blessed and fortunate to meet so many cool people and to go all over the world. So like I said, happy to take questions and whatnot. Okay, Ketman, I wonder if you are still uh, sharing your screen Oh. Uh, because we see all your my desktop uh, yes your desktop yeah let me see what i can do here okay you are screen sharing stop share there we go okay and thank you <laughs> dave do you have do you see the chat are you uh no, I see let's see yeah, How so, long was each oxygen cylinder good for? That's a good question, J.B. Fletcher. But you asked it to everyone, so someone else can answer. No, just kidding. Um, back then, and I don't know what, what the deal is now, but there were basically two kinds. There are these Russian ones called Poisks that were smaller and much lighter and uh, then the ones that International Mountain Guides, and that was the group I went with, were much bigger. And they were 17 pounds, and they held basically about 10 hours worth of oxygen at a flow rate of three liters per minute. So we were figuring you'd have 20 hours worth of oxygen for the summit run, uh, having two cylinders. But so the, the, there was a, a pro and con. The, the pro is you got quite a bit of oxygen versus a Poisk cylinder, but the con is it's still 17 pounds, you know, so it's a little bit heavier. Could you tell us a little bit about how you trained to prepare for this? Uh, yeah, I, I probably, and, and again, one of the great things about mountains is that if, if you want to do, you know, be a good chance for the mountains, it, it really forces you to train and to train hard. And so well, both Everest trips, even though I said I, maybe I could have trained better on that first one, I trained really hard. I was strong enough. I wasn't mentally tough enough. The mental toughness, toughness, is really hard. You know, they say that the seals say there's a 40% rule. You know, when you think you've hit your max, 
you still have 40% more to give or something like that. But as far as training, I, I trained well over a year in advance and I was always in pretty good shape anyways, but I would work out at least five days a week. I'd run hills, you know, like a five mile route. I would run in about 40 minutes. I did lightish weights just to, to stay in decent shape. I killed the stair climber machine. That was one of my best ones because it was pretty easy on the joints, but, but I could work up a great sweat and was really good for endurance. Of course, the best thing to do is to, is to climb you know, at altitude, but in Rochester, New York, you know, you don't have a lot of options for that. I do, I do hear people talk about using hyperbaric train chambers more and more where they'll chamber and, and, and get acclimatized before they even go, which is an interesting way. So I'm looking at other questions. Does that answer your question, Lana? What kind of foods did you eat at the base and higher camps? Well, you try to eat as much food as you can. And the great thing about Sherpas is, is at, at base camp and at, at camp two is that there are cooking Sherpas who just stay there and you get all kinds of stuff. So eggs and rice and, and dal bot, which is sort of the national food of Nepal, which I kind of hate, which is rice with lentils, but it's really good for you. Uh, but anything that you can stomach, like peanut M&Ms were really good. Uh, you know, at, at base camp, it could be French toast and, and we always are, are having lots of Sherpa tea, uh, but tons of rice dishes and, and tons of snacks, anything we can do to try and keep weight on and keep calories on because you're going to lose weight. So, and, and we up higher, we would use MREs, which don't, which are a little bit heavier, which you would never take in like an Adirondack backpacking trip, but because you're so high, the water, you can't, it boils at such a low temperature you can't get uh, noodles and rice to reconstitute. So, but you can heat up MREs and, and that's reasonably palatable. Um, so someone says, please tell us, JB Fletcher, tell us some about Karsten's Pyramid and the Tyrolean Traverse. Well, Karsten's Pyramid is, man, that, that is adventure travel. Uh, it's owned by, it's part of Indonesia, the part we were on, but it's Papua New Guinea. And man, it's the land that time forgot. And to just get to base camp on Karsten's Pyramid, the, the old days you used to trek through uh, crazy villages and through mud and whatnot, but it's not always safe. And cannibalism and head hunting is not that far from removed from there. And the law basically doesn't extend to those places anymore. So it can be dangerous. Uh, so we did a chopper, a helicopter going to uh, base camp uh, and we landed at about 13,000 feet, which is pretty high without acclimatization. Uh, and we stopped at a little place along the way. Uh, and that village was funky and it was scary and more scary on the way out. We were afraid that we weren't going to get out of there. In fact, we left without our gear and later we got, we got it back, but it was really, really funky. That, that could be a story for another time in, into a, of itself, but the Tyrolean Traverse is pretty cool because uh, Karsten's Pyramid is a, a big uh, rock wall climb. So it's pretty steep up. And then you, then you get this very airy knife's edge traverse that, that takes you to the true summit, a little over 16,000 feet. And the Tyrolean Traverse is just uh, stretched out across this gap. It's about 60 feet down to the ridge and then about another 1800 feet on either side all the way down so you are really out there but you know you're well protected and you're hanging from your sit harness but it's like damn we're not in kansas anymore uh but that's that's it's pretty airy up there it was pretty cool so how would you rank the seven summits in terms of difficulty well technically uh karsten's pyramid is probably the the most technical everest is the hardest because it's so long you know i mean Technically, you know, it's not super hard mountaineering. I mean, you have to pay attention and you can certainly fall and die in lots of places. It's not as hard as K2 or anything like that, but it's just mentally grinding. You're there so long and, and to stay up, it's like running a marathon, except for the last mile and a half, you need to sprint, you know, and that's when you're the most beat up. So, so that's where summit day is so weird. So if I had the strength when I first got there and the acclimatization, I think my summit run would have been so much easier, but, and then getting uh, pneumonia, I should not have done that. That was a mistake. 
And I, and I really almost stayed up there uh, where I was just going to take, oh, I'll just bivouac up here. You know, you just, oh, it would have been fine. I would have just slept and I'd still be up there. So, mm. so and, and Denali is another one that, that was my first big mountain. And because we did that as uh, my second trip, it was me and three friends. We're, we're humping lots of big loads on the lower glaciers uh, to get up higher. And so you're just carrying a lot of weight and you climb the mountain twice as you, as you bring, you know, you cash some food up there and you go back and sleep, sleep low, climb high, sleep low. And, and that's a lot of work. And that can be a really, really cold mountain. The coldest I ever was, there's two places I think, it was the, the hut, uh, the, the lean-to at, at Lake Colden in winter <laughs> one time. I, I, we had thermometers that only went down to 25 below, but we heard it was 38 below the night before or that night in uh, Saranac Lake. So we figured it was about 40 below. It was a full moon, absolutely no wind. That was really cold. And the other really, really cold one was... Uh, Antarctica and it was unseasonably cold. Normally the coldest it would be there would be minus 20, but it went to an honest to God minus 40 and that's cold. Jeez. Oh, okay. What procedure did you use to take photos? Uh, you know, the, the first time, did I have a digital camera? I guess I did, yeah. But mostly I, I had a, a a high eight uh, video camera. And I, I've, I've made some videos, commercial videos, like one on Denali, one on Kilimanjaro that I, I sold, but that was a long, long time ago. So I, I was really into shooting a lot of video. So uh, I shot lots of video on the mountains. I did not take my video camera on my summit day of Everest because I was focused. I didn't want the extra couple of pounds. Uh, I, I just wanted to try and make the summit. And some of that footage you saw of that heavy breathing in the Kumbu Icefall, uh, I'd used, a, this was before the days of GoPro. So I, I had somehow to my helmet, I attached a bullet camera, like a security camera and Jerry rigged it to the recorder. And so I just let it run for an hour or so to get footage that way. So point of view footage. Nowadays, the, the, the GoPro footage would be way so much better. So, and then of course, everyone shares photos on climbs and video. Okay, are there any other questions? I would like to thank Kevin for sharing all those videos and telling his story. That was wonderful to hear your treks. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I it so much. Thank you very much. Happy trails. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I heard a number of others. Oh, wow, that's very nice. Okay. Okay. Let's all get let's all get vaccinated and get back to normal and maybe right. somewhere in the Adirondacks. <laughs> all righty. Bye everybody. Bye. Right. Bye. Good night, Good night everyone. Kevin. Thanks. Good night. Bye.